Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is February 27, 1978, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 31. Before I discuss anything else today, I want to take a moment to thank all of you who have been writing, sending news clippings, and your specially made tape recordings. My mail has become so overwhelming that it's physically impossible for me to answer most of you personally, but I do want you to know that even those things which I may not acknowledge for some time are read. The clippings, the tapes, and other personal tips you send me are studied, and it's all very helpful and appreciated, and I thank you again. The task of sorting out and analyzing the intelligence I receive nowadays from sources worldwide is a full-time job for me. On the other hand, the United States Intelligence Community, which employs more than 100,000 persons to do the analyzing for the government, costs the taxpayers billions of dollars a year. And moreover, the United States Intelligence Establishment is hamstrung at the top by over-centralization and a politicized analysis process that has produced a disastrous intelligence gap for America. So today I receive a continuing flood of high-level intelligence from sources who believe you and certain other top officials worldwide should know. From time to time I refer you to other sources of important information so that you can broaden your perspective or get further details. Sometimes these other sources return the favor by expressing very uncomplimentary opinions about me personally, and some of you have written to me greatly shocked over this. But, my friends, I ask you not to lose heart at a few ugly words when they appear. Instead look beyond them to the facts that are documented. Compare those to my warnings and then decide for yourself. There are some who say I should keep quiet about the things I tell you, that I am frightening the people. But, my friends, if I did keep quiet, it would be like an air raid warden who refused to turn on the siren to warn of approaching bombers because that would frighten people. And there are those who say I will ruin my credibility by revealing even hard intelligence about matters that depart so far from popular beliefs. But in the words of General George Keegan, recently retired Chief of Air Force Intelligence, quote, I'd rather be right than credible, unquote. Five years ago I described in detail how the United States dollar would be destroyed deliberately and lead to monetary chaos. It seemed incredible, or as David Rockefeller put it, quote, interesting science fiction, unquote. But today the dollar is following the so-called incredible course I warned about in my book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar, and all the comfortable, credible monetary projections of that day are in the trash bin. Stagflation is confiscating our assets as it was planned to do. The intelligence I am revealing today is every bit as solid as that which I made public five years ago and which is proving true today. But because you still are not being told the truth by the Federal Government or by the controlled major media which gives me the silent treatment, the intelligence I make public leaves many people shaking their heads just as they did five years ago. There have been many over the years who have warned that someday if we didn't watch out the Soviet Union would outstrip the United States militarily. Now some day has arrived. The Soviet Union has achieved dramatic military superiority over the United States, and we are in mortal danger. Now people are asking, what can we do? My friends, in December 1975, over two years ago, I recorded an entire one-hour talking tape entitled, What We Can Do to Save America in order to acquaint you with some of the things every American citizen could do, and periodically in my AUDIO LETTER TAPE SERIES I have made specific suggestions about things you could do under our Constitution to help bring our outlaw government back under our control. But now more than ever the most important thing you can do is to help to bring about total public exposure of the facts of our terrible predicament. Don't expect the controlled major media to do it. They're doing all they can to prevent this exposure because they are being used to control your thinking, not honestly inform you. The time left to us to spread the alarm is very short indeed. For reasons I will explain today, 
Our secret rulers now believe they may have as much as two to three years in which to devise an effective response to the present overwhelming Soviet military might. As I will also explain, they are wrong. But in any case, you and I have very little time left before wartime controls and restrictions start binding and gagging us all. My three topics for today are Topic No. 1, The Dawning of Soviet Cosmo Strategy and Cosmo Politics. Topic No. 2, The Accelerating Build-up to a National Emergency. And Topic No. 3, Growing Casualties in the Secret War over SALT. Topic No. 1. In my book The Conspiracy Against the Dollar, I describe the new imperialism of the International Rockefeller Empire. It's an imperialism in which economic power of multinational corporations and banks, monetary manipulation, and big money politics are used to control entire nations and to reap the profits of East-West trade. The techniques of econo-strategy and econo-politics are the means by which great economic might are translated into the domination of others. These techniques are powerful, but they now face an unprecedented challenge, for in recent months the Soviet Union has suddenly burst into the world arena with its new techniques of cosmo-strategy and cosmo-politics. In these techniques, unlike those of the Rockefeller Establishment, Money is a very secondary factor, important as a tool but nothing more, and in the newly unveiled Soviet approach to world domination, the Earth is viewed basically from the perspective of space, the cosmos. The new era of Soviet Cosmo Strategy and Cosmo Politics dawned in earnest five months ago on September 27, 1977, and our secret masters are still reeling from the shock. On that day, with the first two operational Soviet killer satellites called Cosmos Interceptors in orbit, America lost the first full-fledged space battle in history. The secret American moon base in Copernicus Crater was to have been the ultimate ace in the hole for the Rockefellers in the coming war, armed with powerful beam weapons able to strike the Earth. But in the Battle of the Harvest Moon, the moon base was put out of action by Cosmos 954, the Soviet killer satellite that crashed in Canada last month on January 24. Using a neutron beam weapon, Cosmos 954 killed the entire crew of the Copernicus moon base with a stream of deadly neutron radiation. Our rulers got their first taste of the new Soviet Cosmos strategy that same day September 27, 1977. After a very harsh speech against the United States and the United Nations, Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko demanded and got a hastily arranged unusual evening meeting at the White House with Jimmy Carter and Secretary of State Cyrus Vance. Breathless reporters assured us that there had been a breakthrough in the SALT negotiations, and thereby painted this rush-rush meeting as a good thing. But as I told you in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, the only real breakthrough that had occurred was the Soviet breakthrough in the awesome Particle Beam weapon. Gromyko's message at the White House was an ultimatum to begin the process of surrender by disarming America under the guise of SALT II. In Topic No. 3, I'll bring you up to date on the current status of the struggle over SALT surrender. The Kremlin is playing a deadly game of chess in its bid for world conquest. In any chess game, moves are planned far in advance, in sequence, according to careful strategy. They're not simply made in isolation. And so it was with the Battle of the Harvest Moon last September. The Particle Beam weapons which are now in orbit on Soviet Cosmos Interceptor satellites are the product of a 10-year crash program. But other crash programs have been underway as well in the Soviet Union ever since the Soviet humiliation in the Cuban Missile Crisis 15 years ago. The plan was to develop in total secrecy a spectrum of new super-weapon systems which, taken all together, would leapfrog past the capabilities of the United States. 
They were to be developed, tested, produced in the numbers required for operational deployment, and when ready, held in constant readiness for massive deployment when the time came. That time came five months ago. On September 27, 1977, the Soviet Union dealt the United States a staggering blow, unknown to the public at large because the government refuses to tell you about it. And just two days later the Soviet manned space program began making spectacular headlines after years seemingly in eclipse. On that day the Salyut 6 space station was launched the same space station whose crew are rapidly closing in on America's space endurance record of 84 days. America's moon era had just ended, but that of the Soviet Union was about to begin. Meanwhile Russia was adding rapidly to its fleet of Operational Cosmos Interceptor Killer Satellites. The two that I mentioned in AUDIO LETTER No. 26 were joined by six more in October 1977 and as of now there are over 30 Soviet Cosmos Interceptors orbiting the Earth, all of them manned and all of them armed with Particle Beam weapons. On October 4, 1977, Defense Secretary Harold Brown shocked reporters by confirming part of what I had already revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, namely that the Soviet Union had achieved an Operation or Killer Satellite capability. But by refusing to explain how they work, Dr. Brown succeeded in misleading the reporters into presuming that the Soviet killer satellites work by gliding up next to their target and then exploding. By now this concept is widely accepted as if it were fact, which it is not. But earlier this month, on February 2, 1978, Dr. Brown almost told Congress the truth. He said that the Soviet laser-firing killer satellite, already operational, will be substantially improved by the mid-1980s. My friends, a laser is a beam weapon, so Dr. Brown has now contradicted the assumption that the Soviet killer satellites are of the old explosive type. To tell the complete truth, he should have told Congress that they use particle beams, not lasers. But perhaps that would have been too embarrassing. After all, it was none other than Harold Brown's Livermore Laboratory that failed to develop a particle beam weapon. If Livermore Lab couldn't do it, neither could the Russians. All kinds of cover-up operations are now underway by the United States Government to try to hide from the people what is really happening. For example, in AUDIO LETTER No. 27, I told you about the destruction of America's 85-ton space station known as Skylab. On October 18, 1977, a Soviet Cosmos interceptor blasted Skylab into a giant fireball that was seen by people along the path all the way from southwest Texas to Arkansas and Missouri. Nine days later the cover-up began with government stories that Skylab is unexpectedly sinking toward Earth, and at the beginning of this month the Skylab cover-up story was revived in such a way as to thoroughly confuse the public. Now we are told it looks as though Skylab may crash too soon for the Space Shuttle to save it. It may crash in late 1979, or then again it may crash by late this year. Pretending that Skylab is still up there, some NASA spokesmen say the engine should be fired to make it tumble slowly to keep it in orbit longer. Others say it should be made to tumble so it will come down sooner, say over the Indian Ocean. As I explained in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, the beauty of the Indian Ocean is that over long areas there are no witnesses to observe such things. While Soviet Cosmos interceptors were multiplied in Earth orbit in October, the Soviet Man-Moon program also started in a rush. On October 4, 1977, the 20th anniversary of Sputnik 1 was celebrated by launching Soyuz 25 from the same launch pad. As a cover story, Soyuz 25 was said to have returned to Earth after a few days, having failed to dock with Salyut 6 space station, but in fact Soyuz 25 went on to make a manned landing on the Moon on October 16, 1977, landing on the far side in Jules Verne Crater for reasons I explained in AUDIO LETTER No. 27. In the new Soviet Cosmos strategy, 
The massive deployment of men and equipment to the moon was just the space-age equivalent of a military deployment by airlift. The men, the spacecraft, the particle beam weapons, everything had been prepared for this giant military operation in space, and given the Soviet network of several major spaceports, which they call Cosmodromes, launch rates unheard of in the United States were and are possible. Over the past five years the Soviet Union has consistently launched satellites six and one-half times as frequently as the United States and that is based only on those that the Soviet Union has reported so that they can be tracked by the West. There have been hundreds of secret launches of satellites that have never been positively detected or tracked in the West. During October and November, as I have detailed in previous tapes, the Moon was quickly converted into a military base of the Soviet Union. Today. There are seven separate Particle Beam Weapons installations on the near side of the Moon, plus a backup and supply base on the far side, and as I revealed in December, the Lunar Particle Beam Weapons have been test-fired at the Earth. In December I also revealed that Particle Beam Weapons were being fired in a defocused mode of operation off the East Coast, causing mysterious air booms called airquakes. These Particle Beam weapons are carried by floating platforms which are not satellites in orbit. They can operate all the way from ground zero to altitudes of at least 800 miles. Normally they stay high enough to be outside the atmosphere. These platforms, which uh, use a principle known as electrogravitics, could have been developed long ago by the United States but were not, and now we have no defense against them. When I say platform, I'm speaking in the military sense of a vehicle on which weapons are mounted. A naval ship is sometimes thought of as a gun platform. In the same way, an attack helicopter may be called a platform for the guns it carries. The Soviet floating particle beam platforms, according to my latest information, are actually spheres known as Cosmospheres. As with the other aspects of the sudden, decisive Soviet leap into Cosmostrategic weapons, the Federal Government is trying to keep a lid on the Cosmosphere story. The White House is trying desperately to come up with some kind of story to explain those airquakes which have rattled nerves and broken windows. Within a few days the Naval Research Laboratory is supposed to deliver a preliminary report explaining what the airquakes are. Every effort will be made to focus attention only on the East Coast. But airquakes are beginning to be heard elsewhere also as other Cosmospheres announce their presence. For example, at about noon Friday, February 3, two airquakes were heard off the Texas Gulf Coast near Port Lavaca. There were two booms in quick succession heard over an area of four large counties. Then silence. The Coast Guard reported no aircraft on radar at the time and there were no military aircraft in the vicinity. They were typical airquakes, my friends. The story was embargoed until four days later, Tuesday, and released only over the Texas wire of the Associated Press. As a result, they received no national publicity, and there have been and will be others around the country. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 30 last month, the Cosmospheres over the United States had all descended to relatively low altitudes ranging from 15 to 60 miles. As of my latest report on February 23, they have climbed back up to more normal altitudes of around 400 miles except for one over the Detroit area. This one, reported on that day to be at a height of 140 miles, was at a lower altitude earlier this month, and at that time there were many sightings around the Detroit area of an object that may well have been this Cosmosphere. As I explained in Topic No. 3, foot dragging by our secret rulers in agreeing to surrender by means of SALT II is provoking once again an increase in Soviet acts of intimidation. For that reason I think I should alert you to the latest locations of the Soviet Cosmospheres over North America. The Cosmosphere recently stationed over the Detroit area is the same one that formerly was over the Carolinas and caused many airquakes along the East Coast. 
another is over the western Pennsylvania, West Virginia area. Another, formerly stationed in the vicinity of Quincy, Illinois, is currently over the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. There is a Cosmosphere roughly over the Mississippi River, east of Little Rock, Arkansas. Another is over the Red River between Oklahoma City and the Dallas-Fort Worth area. A Cosmosphere is hovering almost directly over NORAD headquarters in Colorado. Another is over Hoover Dam on the Nevada-Arizona border and another is over the Glen Canyon Dam in northern Arizona. There is another over western Montana, and those over southern Alaska and just west of Hawaii are still on station. There is one new Cosmosphere reported this month, located at last report over the waters between the southern tip of Florida and Cuba. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 30 last month on the evening of January 28, I had just received word that the crew in Capsule Cosmos 954, the killer satellite that had crashed in Canada, had been picked up by a Soviet Cosmosphere previously stationed over Ottawa. I can now finish the story with the news that just before midnight that same night, Eastern Time, the Cosmosphere landed in a wilderness area north of Lake Superior at coordinates 48, 18 north, 85, 42 west. There the crew and capsule were transferred to a truck driven by Soviet agents after which the Cosmosphere departed. It's presently on station 212 miles north of Ottawa at an altitude of 300 miles. Needless to say, the search by Canadian and American teams for pieces of Cosmos 954 has no hope of ever turning up anything legitimate except auxiliary chunks of the satellite. Cosmos 954 was one of the two Soviet killer satellites which were operational when I record AUDIO LETTER No. 26. The other, launched last July, was Cosmos 929. Cosmos 929 was the first operational Cosmos Interceptor satellite, and as I discussed in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, it destroyed an American spy satellite over Russia on September 20. Early this month, on February 2, Cosmos 929 fired its retrofire engines and re-entered the atmosphere over the Soviet Union, contrary to other published reports. Space operations in support of Soviet Cosmos strategy are continuing on all fronts. Progress 1, the space bus with nine cosmonauts aboard that was described as a robot supply ship by Moscow transferred supplies to Salyut 6 and then detached itself. Progress 1 is still in orbit awaiting the next stage of the project of building a mammoth new space station in space. As I told you last month, Progress 1 is to become one part of the new space station, and on February 16 the cosmonauts on Salyut 6 accomplished another space first. They had started up an electric blast furnace which had been brought up by Progress 1, and the cosmonauts were to begin acquiring experience toward building large stations in space. A few days ago Moscow correctly announced that the crew of Salyut 6 have also been busy observing, from their ringside seat in space, various weather phenomena and natural disasters. And no wonder, since geophysical warfare is also an operational part of the new Soviet Cosmo strategy. Beginning in AUDIO LETTER No. 24 last May, I've been warning about Soviet preparations to cause deliberate earthquakes and tidal waves as weapons of undeclared war. That month I gave the navigational coordinates where seven Soviet fission-fusion-fission super bombs had already been planted in strategic undersea locations around the Philippines. And a year ago this month I referred to the fact that major Soviet experiments in weather modification were known to have been carried out on certain occasions. Last August I revealed that cobalt bombs were being planted in the oceans as strategic locations to serve in a build-up of earthquake activity prior to the big catastrophe that awaits the Philippines and America's west coast, and I have revealed since then that some of these have been set off. Only recently I have been informed that some of the cobalt bombs have purposes other than earthquakes. In the North Pacific, two large warm water zones were discovered last fall. These warm water zones are pumping huge amounts of moisture into the air streams that sweep across America from the Pacific and creating tremendous air turbulence in the process. 
The result? Blizzards, high winds, and floods, which could very well affect our food supply in the near future. These hot water zones have been caused by the deliberate cracking of the seafloor to vent volcanic heat into the ocean. The center of one hot water zone thus created is located at 50, 37, 8 north, 170, 32, 51 east, near Atu in the Aleutians. The other is at 25, 34, 23 north, 151, 1841 west, between Hawaii and California. At both of these locations Soviet Cobalt bombs were planted and set off last summer. Last April I alerted you that Soviet nuclear sabotage of the United States had begun, focusing at first on our dams and reservoirs, and last May, before suspending the AUDIO letter for three months in an all-out effort to expose and stop the mounting Soviet sabotage campaign, I told you of the Soviet strategy to use water against us as a weapon. Last month a severe two-year drought in California was broken by unrelenting torrential rainstorms. Now there is a threat of such heavy spring runoff that floods will be a problem instead of drought, and now, thanks to Soviet modification of America's weather, our major dams are being filled up just as they must be to produce maximum destruction when they are blown apart by Soviet nuclear mines. Topic No. 2 In the past I have repeatedly given a warning about the deliberate crushing shortages which are being arranged to strike America along with the collapse of the United States dollar and vanishing freedoms and property. And beginning in AUDIO LETTER no. 10 nearly two years ago, I have made public the Presidential Executive Orders which already exist under which the declaration of a national emergency can be used to intensify shortages and suspend our Constitution. Today the controlled Carter Administration is silently preparing for the intended declaration of a national emergency. Overseas the Middle East is going faster and faster down the one-way corridor that is leading to war, and as I said last November, the attempted peace initiative to Israel by President Sadat of Egypt was an unnatural move for which he was programmed without his knowledge by certain elements within the CIA. Its purpose, unknown to Sadat himself, was to alter the situation in the Middle East in such a way that it would lead to war, not peace, and day by day now Sadat is becoming visibly more dejected and desperate. The controlled Carter Administration has discovered that it is not possible any longer to turn aside the Middle East war momentum. Thus the Carter Administration, flying the banner always of peace, peace, is now proposing a huge new sale of combat aircraft to Israel, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia. The real target in all of this is Saudi Arabia, which has made the fatal mistake of allowing itself to be dragged in now as a confrontation state against Israel. These maneuvers are continuing the public relations trickery of our secret rulers that began several months ago, giving the image to the public that we are becoming more aloof from Israel. At the same time, more and more excuses are being set up to make Israel appear to be threatened in a vital manner. Thus the cover story is being established for a preemptive limited nuclear strike against Arab OPEC oil wells. The war plan which I revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 6 for November 1975 is being updated and set in motion now, and when it comes the cutoff of Middle East oil will give our secret rulers the excuse to greatly intensify the regulation and limitation of our personal activities. As a prelude to this, America's longest coal strike is still underway. Last Friday evening, February 24, Jimmy Carter had announced that he would reveal drastic measures to end the strike in a speech scheduled for 9 p.m. Eastern Time, but instead, two hours before that, he announced a negotiated settlement reached at the last minute between the Miners' Union and the Rockefeller-controlled coal operators. He presented it to the nation as if there were nothing left to be concerned about, but the whole thing is nothing more than a ploy 
to waste time and finally provide an excuse for really harsh Federal action. Every possible means is being used to ensure that the miners do not ratify the latest settlement just as they turned down the earlier one several weeks ago. On one hand, the proposed contract is strewn with flaws designed to displease the rank-and-file miners, and on the other side of the coin the miners are quietly being provided with many forms of support to deliberately minimize the pressure on them to settle. They are encouraged to pretend to outsiders that they have no money and thereby qualify for food stamps, unemployment, and welfare assistance. In addition, credit unions are providing many miners with practically interest-free loans. Creditors are placing a moratorium on miners' accounts, and banks are not trying to collect miners' debts. Major creditors controlled by our secret rulers are setting the pace and others are following their example. And so, if all goes according to plan, the early days of March will see the supposed new coal strike settlement break down. Jimmy Carter, as before, will delay and delay, but with utilities running out of coal and the winter still not over, those drastic Federal measures will be imposed at last. The emergency powers of the President will be invoked, seemingly for limited purposes, but at the same time the bureaucracy for the coming unlimited national emergency will have been set in motion. Topic No. 3 in 1972, Colonel Raymond S. Sleeper, United States Air Force retired, wrote an article for the American Security Council entitled USSR First in Space Power. It was published on March 6, 1972 in the Washington Report No. WR72-4 of the American Security Council. In his article, Colonel Sleeper describes how Russia's space bomb satellite had already demonstrated its ability to blow up an enemy satellite in space, a concept that has now been superseded by the operational fleet of Cosmos Particle Beam Interceptors. He also describes other facets of the widening lead in Soviet military use of space and says, quote, they already have the capability to launch a major military space force to bludgeon the United States to accommodation on a particular request or demand." Unquote. Illustrating how it could work, he begins with the words, quote, Assume for the sake of an example that the impasse continues in the negotiations between the United States and the USSR for the limitation of strategic weapons, that is, SALT, and that the Soviet-sponsored European Security Conference is convened to reduce tensions quote, unquote, on the continent. End of quote. Pointing out the vulnerable status of Europe relative to the Warsaw Pact forces, he continues, quote, The USSR launches several orbital satellites. It tells the world they are orbital bombers. United States space detection systems verify the satellite's presence. The Soviets assert that the satellites are able to destroy any target in Europe or the United States but that their real purpose is to ensure a peaceful Europe." Unquote. With the West confronted with a dilemma over these satellites, Colonel Sleeper continues, quote, Then to climax their ploy, the Soviets detonate a nuclear explosion over the eastern Atlantic Ocean 50 or 100 miles out in space. All of Europe would be suitably impressed and would accept what, in view of this demonstration of Soviet military power, now seem very reasonable proposals for peaceful coexistence quote unquote, between the nations of Eastern and Western Europe. The United States, powerless, would be excluded." Unquote. To obtain more details uh, from Colonel Sleeper's account, I suggest you write to the American Security Council at Boston, Virginia, ZIP 22713. To bring Colonel Sleeper's scenario into a virtual reality today, it is only necessary to add the elements of widespread sabotage, replace the hypothetical space bombers with Cosmos interceptor satellites and Cosmos spheres, and realize that only government leaders are let in on these things today, not the public. 
Every time new snags develop in the salt talks in Geneva, new explosions and other acts of Soviet intimidation increase in the United States. In recent weeks the earlier predictions of an early SALT agreement have been replaced once again by stalling by our secret rulers, and once again disasters are striking seemingly at random around the United States. Last month I told you that the Soviet Union is now ready militarily to destroy the United States in nuclear war and to survive our counterattack, if any. But I also informed you about a drastic new change within the Kremlin itself. With Leonid Brezhnev physically incapacitated, the Hawks have taken over in the Kremlin since early December, and as a result Soviet policies have become openly more aggressive lately. The situation as a result is highly volatile. Anything can happen. There is a major threat, as I warned you last month that the military KGB secret police faction that now controls the Kremlin may step up the plans for war and strike without warning, which they are well able to do. Soviet nuclear mines now dot the United States. Soviet underwater nuclear missiles infest our territorial waters, including the Great Lakes, and as of my latest report, the Soviet submarine armadas I told you about last month are still there along our Pacific, Atlantic, and Gulf coasts. But in spite of this volatile situation and extreme danger, I should also give you the assessment of our secret rulers themselves so that you can understand their approach to the current situation. For more than two months following America's loss of the decisive Battle of the Harvest Moon in space last September, the controlled Carter Administration was in complete disarray. In mid-October, with the American satellites evaporating in fireballs worldwide and the Soviet fleet in a pincer's movement threatening imminent attack, the Carter Administration set its capitulation to Moscow. In other words, surrender by means of a lopsided SALT II agreement would proceed. Both Soviet and American decorations indicated that SALT II was moving fast. An agreement by the end of December was the deadline set by Brezhnev. But in November violent cross currents began surfacing over SALT. As I explained then, our rulers were stalling for time, using controversy in Congress as a shield. Immediately Brezhnev tightened the screws with undersea detonation, the destruction of Tokoa Dam in Carter's home state of Georgia, a violent rail blast in Erie, South Korea, and other measures. Soon Administration actions and statements appeared to be once again following the dictates of the Kremlin. In early December, with the original Brezhnev deadline on SALT II drawing near, Soviet intimidation of America began mounting in rapid fashion. On December 2, 1977, the first of the mysterious airquakes along the East Coast began, courtesy of Soviet Cosmosphere No. 1 in the list of seven I made public that month. That same month California experienced unprecedented sandstorms with 100 mile per hour winds as major Soviet weather modification measures began to take effect, and just three days before Christmas Soviet nuclear mines began destroying grain elevators and other important targets in a continuing rash without precedent in our country. But by then Leonid Brezhnev was a very sick man. He sickened rapidly and I can now reveal that Leonid Brezhnev died in Moscow in early January. Beginning several weeks ago, a ceremonial double for Brezhnev has been making public appearances in order not to let the world know about the turbulence now going on within the Kremlin. But our unelected rulers know, and now they are using whatever time that is left to move desperately in a crash program to ally themselves with Red China and turn China into a credible threat against Russia. And wherever possible, military research and development is being cranked up secretly in a crash program to produce new weapons in time to effectively oppose the awesome military might of the Soviet Union. The United States tilt toward China is reflected in the foreign policy statements of American officials. As recently as last November 16, Defense Secretary Harold Brown told the Japanese that decreasing American commitments in the area 
would have to be expected, and yet early this month he revealed in a foreign policy speech in California that the United States is giving renewed emphasis to our commitments in Asia. He is hurrying to reassure and bolster South Korea with new fighter aircraft, and privately there is some rethinking being done about the announced policy of withdrawing American troops there. He is also talking very differently than earlier about the necessity of retaining the major naval and Air Force facilities in the Philippines. My friends, our secret rulers and their advisors are telling themselves that they can hold off the Soviet Union for perhaps two to three years before the internal consolidation of the Kremlin bureaucracy takes hold. By then our secret rulers hope to have Red China firmly in hand, ready to throw into the fray with Russia, and in all of this the tremendous financial grip of Japan by our secret rulers, the four Rockefeller brothers, is being used as a major tool. Japan has just signed an historic eight-year $20 billion trade agreement with China which already is thawing the diplomatic ice between these two Asian giants. Meanwhile, Rockefeller doors are being flung wide open for Red China here and abroad, and Red Chinese trade delegations are hustling around the United States, Europe, Asia, and Japan in a rush of activity. All of this may sound as if the mighty Rockefellers are going to pour a rabbit out of that hat once again, as they have done in the past and still end up on top. But what they are actually doing, my friends, is digging an ever deeper, wider grave for themselves and for America. The Soviet Union saw long ago what is now happening and has already prepared Japan to join in agreements to offset those with China. Japan will in due course sign in principle a draft of a Treaty of Friendship and Cooperation in spite of Japan's demands for the return of four Japanese islands seized by Russia at the end of World War II. The Rockefeller economic power in Japan is formidable, but the Japanese want out from under the Rockefeller yoke. Quoting now from my book, page 76, this situation could continue for a reasonable length of time, culminating in Japan's causing China and the Soviet Union to join with her in agreements opening huge economic markets stretching from East Germany to the far reaches of East Asia. These agreements would constitute in effect a military alliance between the three Asian powers, and thus would be born in this century another Axis a Moscow-Tokyo-Peking axis, a new gigantic Asian power block cemented on Moscow-Tokyo-Peking relations, three Asian giants." End of quotation from my book. The Rockefellers helped Soviet Russia to grow into the world's number one military power only to lose control over their Frankenstein monster, but it seems they never learn. Now the process of building up Red China as fast as possible has begun, and that will end in utter catastrophe. Ultimately the forces tending to join Russia, China, and Japan in a giant new Asian axis far outweigh the minor influences the Rockefellers can bring to bear. The Rockefellers are right in believing that a process of settling in and consolidation lies ahead for the Kremlin. But they are wrong, dead wrong, in believing this will weaken the Kremlin to such a point that the present overwhelming Soviet military advantage will be allowed to slip away. The Soviet Union, increasingly under the influence of Defense Minister Marshal Dmitry Ustinov, is keeping a close eye on the military situation. The Rockefeller dream of overturning the Soviet advances in military technology in the space of two to three years is unrealistic to the point of arrogance. But just to make sure, Soviet sabotage of key plants and installations nationwide has already been carried out. For example, consider a small sampling in my own hometown of Huntington, West Virginia. The International Nickel Plant now contains three Soviet nuclear weapons, the Owens, Illinois Plant, two, and the Hudal Plant, where secret work is underway, two. In addition to sabotage, my friends, there is a campaign of espionage by the Soviet KGB against America. On February 9 earlier this month, 
a sensational Soviet spy case broke in Canada. Last April in AUDIO LETTER No. 23 I revealed that Soviet agents were planting nuclear weapons in dams and reservoirs in the United States, and the following month I detailed the role of Canada being used as a staging area into the United States by the KGB. In AUDIO LETTER No. 24 I revealed the crucial role played by the RCMP, the Mounties, in attempting to stop the growing sabotage of the United States while American authorities were doing nothing whatever about it. Now we've been told publicly that the Mounties have been involved since at least last April in a counterintelligence operation against KGB operations in Canada, and the RCMP has received a lot of praise in place of the usual abuse for their breakup of the celebrated KGB spy ring. Thirteen spies, diplomatic personnel at the Soviet Embassy in Ottawa have been expelled. In recent years Soviet espionage cases have been boiling over repeatedly in the West, major cases involving top military and governmental officials and the compromise of massive amounts of sensational and sensitive material. It has happened in Canada, in Britain, which recently expelled over 100 Soviet spies, in Sweden, in Denmark, in West Germany, and even in Switzerland. But here in the United States the biggest of all Soviet espionage targets, the KGB has become so powerful that no such exposures happen. A big deal was made recently of spying activities by a single diplomat from a superpower known as Vietnam, but not a word about the thousands of KGB agents which have been crisscrossing our land planting nuclear mines for the coming war. The situation would be different had J. Edgar Hoover not been murdered, but then Nelson Rockefeller always said the FBI was a fascist organization. Can you imagine? But in spite of the good publicity the Mounties received from the big spy case in Canada, the RCMP is not happy because the KGB won rather than losing in that case. The Ottawa spy ring case was deliberately exposed prematurely by a Soviet agent who fed the story to a Canadian reporter. The story was printed, the RCMP's cover was blown, and the massive KGB operations now underway in Canada were rendered safer than ever, because in Canada as here the KGB has friends in very high places. At the present time big Aleutian airliners of the Soviet Airline Aerofloat together with Cuban, Polish, and Czechoslovakian airliners can be seen frequently at the Mirabelle and Dorval airports in Montreal, this despite the fact that very few commercial air travelers fly between Canada and Eastern Europe. In addition, camouflage Soviet troop transports, each able to carry 50 fully armed troops with supplies and bearing no identification marks have also been passing through the Montreal airports in large groups. Operating under the protection of certain very highly placed agents in the Canadian Government, the KGB has established no fewer than 12 guerrilla camps in remote areas of Quebec Province. At the present time over 3,000 KGB trained personnel are in Canada able to speak fluent English and prepare to infiltrate into the United States at will. Unlike the Canadian and American citizens who have acted as Soviet agents in planting nuclear mines nationwide, these are trained guerrillas prepared to undertake important insurgency operations against targets either in Canada or in the United States. By weather modification, by sabotage, by espionage, and by other means a secret war is now underway between the Kremlin and the United States over SALT II, which is to be America's Surrender Treaty. The casualties in this secret war are civilians, and the toll is rising. The men, women, and children killed in the Tekoa Falls Dam collapse are casualties in this secret war. The workers and inspectors killed and injured in the explosion of sabotaged grain elevators are casualties in this secret war. Those who have died in artificial killer storms are casualties in this secret war. And those who were killed and injured recently in the propane explosion at Waverly, Tennessee are casualties in this secret war. 
Last time it was Erie, South Korea, back in November. A railroad car full of dynamite was used as a perfect cover for the detonation of two fairly large buried nuclear mines. This time it was brought closer to home. In Waverly, two tank cars full of propane were derailed on Wednesday, February 22, but they lay there safely till Friday until just before workmen were about to start emptying them. Then without warning and with no apparent cause, one tank exploded. As some witnesses said, quote, like an atomic bomb, unquote. A huge black mushroom cloud billowed into the sky, leaving over nine dead, scores injured, and the downtown area flattened and burning. Philip Hooper, Vice President of the l and Railroad, said, quote, It was unusual. These derailed cars were there for 24 hours and did not leak. We had a call from our expert at the car that they were going to begin the transfer in eight minutes. Then it blew. It did not follow a normal explosion. It ruptured, then it exploded." Unquote. Thus another KGB sabotage operation within our own country drew to a close. Sabotage brought about the derailment and the explosion. Sabotage targets also include oil tank farms, oil pipelines, and other like installations. In the closing words of my book, I warned five years ago that, quote, if the new Asian forces are not understood but are met with ignorance and arrogance, then the world will indeed be headed not for a generation of peace, of which President Nixon has so proudly boasted, but for World War III." Unquote. Today our secret rulers are meeting the new Asian forces with the ignorance and arrogance of those who do not recognize any power higher than themselves. By so doing, they are bringing the wrath of God upon themselves and upon all the rest of us. We will be chastised as well as cleansed in the process. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless and protect each and every one of you.